Part 4. The only tool we can wield. A testament of the tool. The sanctimonious civilians who would wage unwarranted war were an abomination to the tool. He would descend on them as the furious beating of a million wings, and the skies would rage with thunder. The unrepentant would be struck down, but those who fell to their knees would be spared. Then he would leave them dissolving once more into a storm of feathers and disappearing to the calming sky. All rejoice! Commentary of Great Symphonius The tool was not only a man of bliss, but the master of it. He possessed the ability to transform into any creature or multitude of creatures. This verse illustrates his ability to become a great flock of birds, most likely eagles, falcons, or owls, graceful, noble, wise but also to be feared and respected, creatures that were the epitome of all the tall was. Coda's Analysis of Symphonius The ever-present problem with Symphonius is his inconsistency. He sees things as symbolic or literal whenever it suits him. Thus, his interpretations are more whim than wisdom. While it's possible that the tall could have taken form as a flock, is it not more likely that he simply possessed the mystical ability to fly like the caped heroes of Archibald graphics? Chapter 32 A Grim Fulcrum The cathedral bells that rang out the hours for nearly a thousand years in Oroscandia had been silenced, ripped out, torn apart, melted in a makeshift furnace. A great concern hall in the same region had been raided in the middle of a performance, and amid the panic of the crowd, tonists flooded the stage, breaking the smaller instruments by hand and taking access to the larger ones. Your voices are music to my ears, the doll had one said, which clearly meant that all other music had to be destroyed. This extreme civil sex found in their devotion a need to impose their beliefs on the wall. No two sects of siblings were alike. Each one was its own unique aberration, with its own frightening interpretations of Tony's doctrine and twistings of the tall's words. The only thing they all had in common was a propensity for violence and intolerance, including the intolerance of other Tonists, for any sect that did not believe precisely as they did was clearly lesser. There were no siblings before the Thunderhead fell silent. Yes, there were sects that had extreme beliefs, but the Thunderhead and the Nimbus agents of the Authority interface reined them in. Violence would not be tolerated. But once the world was in savory and the Thunderhead spoke no more, many things, in many places, began to fester. In the oldest cities of Oroscandia, groups of roaming siblings would leave bonfires in public squares full of pianos, cellos, and guitars, and although they would be caught and detained by peace officers every time, they would not stop. People hoped that the Thunderhead, even in its silence, would supplant them, replacing their minds and their entire identities with ones that would be content and not prone to violence. But that would be a violation of religious freedom. So the siblings were detained, forced to pay for the replacement of the things they had destroyed, and then released, only to destroy these things again. The Thunderhead, if it could speak, might say that they were providing a service, and that by destroying musical instruments, it provided work for those whose job it was to create such instruments. But even for the Thunderhead, enough was enough. The doll appeared to the Roscandian siblings as they prepared to lay waste to another concert hall. The Oroscondian civilians knew it must be an impostor, for the doll had been martyred at the hands of a scythe. Resurrection was not a tenet of their belief, so the zealots were skeptical. Drop your weapons and fall to your knees, the impostor said. They did no such thing. The tone and the thunder are offended by your actions, and so am I. Drop your weapons and fall to your knees. Still, they did not obey. One of them ran forward speaking in an old language native to the region that few people spoke anymore. Then, from the impostor's small turret, a denim robed scythe came forward, caught the attacker, and threw him to the ground. The attacker, bruised and bloody, scampered away. It is not too late to repent, 
the troll imposter said. The, ton, the thunder, and I will forgive you if you renounce your destructive ways and serve us in peace. The siblings looked past him to the doors of the concert hall. Their goal was so close, but there was something commanding about this young man before them. Something divine. I give you a sign, he said, from the thunderhead to whom I alone can speak and to whom I alone can intercede on your behalf. Then he spread out his arms. And out of the sky... They came, morning doves, a hundred of them swooping in from all directions, as if they had been waiting all this time in the eaves of every building in the city. They landed on him, perching on his arms, his body, his head, until he could not be seen anymore. They covered him from head to toe, their light brown bodies and wings like a soul, like an armor around him, and the color of it, the pattern of the feathers involving him, the way they moved. The civil antagonist realized what he now resembled. He looked like a storm cloud, a thunderhead billowing with wrath. Suddenly, the birds took off in all directions, leaving him and disappearing back to the hidden corners of the city from whence they came. All was silent but for the last flapping of the parting wings. And in that silence, the tall spoke in nearly a whisper. Now drop your weapons and fall to your knees. And they did. Being a dead prophet was much better than being a live one. When you were dead, you weren't obliged to fill your days with a mind-numbing parade of supplicants. You were free to go where you wanted, when you wanted, and more importantly, where you were needed. But the best part about it was that nobody tried to kill you. Being dead, Grison Tolliver concluded, was much better for his peace of mind than being alive. Since his public demise, Grissom had spent over two years traveling the world in an attempt to wrangle in the civil antagonists that were popping up everywhere. He and everyone with him traveled as modestly as possible. Public trains, commercial airlines. Grissom never wore his embroidered scapular and violet tunic when they traveled. They were all incognito, in simple, drab, tonist attire. No one asked questions of Tonys for fear that they'd start posing their beliefs. Most people would look the other way, avoiding eye contact. Of course, if Great Mendoza had his way, they would travel the world in a private jet with vertical landing capability, so the all could plop out of the sky like an actual god machine. But Grison forbade it, feeling there was already too much hypocrisy in the world. Tonists are not supposed to be materialistic. He told Mendoza. Neither are sides, Mendoza pointed out. And how did that work out? Nevertheless, this wasn't a democracy. What they all said was law among them, no matter who disagreed with it. Sister Astrid was on Christian's side. I think your resistance to extravagance is a good thing, she said. And I imagine the Thunderhead agrees. As long as we get where we're going by the time we need to get there, the Thunderhead has no opinion, Grison told her. Although he suspected that the Thunderhead was rotting trains and flies to speed their way to their destinations. Grayson supposed that if the Toll proclaimed they must travel by mule, the Thunderhead would somehow supply them with racing mules. Even with all this trouble, Mendoza always managed to find a way to make their arrival dramatic and impressive enough to shake civil antagonists to their corroded foundations. Whatever strange and disturbing things they were doing, Grissom would reveal himself to them as the toll and denounce them, renounce them, and basically sat them down, leaving them begging for his forgiveness. The trick with the birds had been Grissom's idea. It was easy enough. All Earth's creatures had nanites so that the Thunderhead could monitor their populations, which meant that the Thunderhead had a back door into each species' behavior. The Scython had done something similar with the sea life around Endura, turning them into a free-range aquarium. But unlike that ill-fated technology, the Thunderhead did not manipulate the animals for human pleasure, or, as it turned out in the end, human pain. It only controlled a creature if that creature was in danger of becoming roadkill or engaging in any other behavior that would end its life. As there were no revival centers for white animals, it was the most effective way to allow them to live the full length of their natural lives. If I'm supposed to stop sea balloons, Grayson had said to the Thunderhead, then I need to show them something impressive. 
something that will prove to them that you are on my side and not theirs. He proposed the gathering of storm cloud colored birds lighting all over him on the Thunderhead of Lights. And there were other tricks like the reason just. Of course, the Thunderhead could cause publicers to encircle the Tonists, hurting them like sheep. It could generate a magnetic field strong enough to levitate Grissom with no visible means of doing so, and when weather conditions were right, the Thunderhead could induce lightning storm at Grissom's command. But the birds were the best. It never failed to do so, and always brought sibilants around. If not back into line, then at least it started them moving in the right direction. Of course, being covered in dogs and pigeons was not a pleasant thing. Their talons left scratches and gouges in his skin. They often tried to peck at his ears and eyes, and they were not the most hygienic of animals. He would stay with the sect in question just long enough to make sure they were changing their ways. Coming back into the fold, Mendoza called it. Then the toll would disappear with his entourage and move on to another sect of sibilants in another part of the world. Surgical strikes and guerrilla diplomacy, that was his strategy for two years, and it was working. It helped that there were more the reckless rumors about him than legitimate ones. The toll made the mountain crumble with his voice. The toll was seen dining in the desert with mortal age god and was at the head of the table. It was easy to hide his actual appearances in the folds of the absurd ones. It's good that we do this, Great Mendoza would say, but it's nothing compared to what we could be doing. It's what the Thunderhead wants, Grayson would tell him, but Mendoza was always dubious. And, truth be told, Grayson was just as frustrated. You have me on a treadmill, Grayson had told the Thunderhead. What am I accomplishing if civil sex are popping up faster than I can turn them? Is this your big plan? And isn't it wrong for me to pretend to be a god? Define wrong, the Thunderhead had said. The Thunderhead was particularly annoying when Grayson put forth ethical questions. It could not lie, but Grayson could, and did. He lied to the Silva and Chaterbro in counter, telling them he was beyond human. Even so, the Thunderhead would not stop him from doing it, so he had no idea if it approved or disapproved. A simple, don't do that, would have sufficed if the Thunderhead felt his actions were an abuse of his power. In fact, being chastised by the Thunderhead would be comforting, because then he'd know if his own moral compass was off the mark. On the other hand, if the end did justify Grissom's means, why couldn't the Thunderhead just tell him so, and ease his mind? If you do anything that is too damn young, I will inform you, the Thunderhead had told him which left Grayson constantly waiting for a slap that never came. I've done some terrible things in your name, he told the Thunderhead, to which the Thunderhead replied, Define terrible. The tall centurage, which had contracted to his senior circle, Scythe Morrison, Sister Ostrid, and Great Mendoza, had become an effective them. Morrison had proven himself bullyable right from the beginning. He never really had much of a work ethic before showing up to clean the doll, but these years had changed him considerably, or at least carved him a new road that was a little more enlightened. He had his reasons for staying. After all, where would he go? The North American Sidon thought he was dead, but that was only part of it. The thing is, if the North American Sidon were to check their own statistics, they'd know that he'd cleaned and granted immunity more than once. Well, he told himself, with so much cleaning going on these days, they couldn't be expected to notice the actions of one rock scythe. Of course, he knew that wasn't the truth, but the truth hurt a little too much to admit. They didn't notice, because they didn't care. He had always been an non-entity to the other scythes. An embarrassment to his mentor, who chose him because he was strong and good-looking, and then disowned him the moment it became clear that he'd never win anyone's respect. To them, he was a joke. But at least here, in the surface of the toll, his existence was acknowledged. He had a place and a purpose. He was the protector, and he liked it. Sister Ostrid was the only one who had issues with Morrison. You, Jim, embody everything about the world he can stand, she once told him, which made him grin. Why can't you just admit that you like me? I tolerate you. There's a big difference. As for Ostrid, 
She had her work cut out for her keeping them all on the proper spiritual path. She stayed with the toll because deep down, she believed that Grison Tolliver was the real thing, that he was divinely moved by the tone, and that his humility about it was understandable. A humble nature was, after all, the hallmark of a true holy man. It made perfect sense that he would refuse to believe that he was part of the holy triad, but just because he didn't believe it himself didn't make it an illustrious. She would secretly smirk each time he faced civil and Tony stats at all, because she knew he didn't believe a single thing he said. To him, it was just a role, but to Astrid, his denial made it all the more true. And then there was Great Mendoza, the magician, the showman, the producer of the retroubling show. He knew he was the linchpin holding it all together, and although there were times that he actually believed his own faith, that always got trampled by the practicality of getting the job done. Mendoza not only organized the tall's appearances, but kept in close communication with his network of greats around the globe, in a constant attempt to wrangle more and more sects under one accepted doctrine, and to help them protect themselves against sides. Mendoza also worked in the shadows, spreading many of the false rumors about the tall. They were amazingly helpful in keeping the flock engaged, and in keeping sides disengaged, because how could sides give any credence to tall sightings when most of them were flights of fancy? Yet when Grison found out what Mendoza was doing, he was horrified. How could Grison not see the value? You're telling people that I've risen from my own asses? There is precedent, Mendoza tried to explain. The history of faith is full of falling, rising gods. I'm laying the groundwork for your legend. If people want to believe that, fine, Grayson said. But I don't want to encourage it by spreading more lies. If you want me to help you, why do you keep tying my hands? Mendoza said, increasingly frustrated. Maybe because I want you to use your hands for something more than pleasuring yourself. That actually made Mendoza laugh because what had these past few years been but Chris and Tolliver spurring his will in everyone else's direction. But laughing at the toll was over the line, so he backpedaled quickly. Uh, yes, your sonority, Mendoza said, as he always said. I'll try to keep that in mind. He had no choice but to back off, because arguing did nothing with this hot strong boy. A boy who had no idea what it actually took to keep his mystique alive. Although Mendoza was beginning to wonder why he even bothered. Then something happened that changed everything. Grief, grief, and more grief, the Thunderhead wailed in Grison's ear one evening. I wish I could have blinded my eyes to it. This event is a grim fulcrum upon which many things will pivot. Can you please not speak in riddles? Grison asked. And just tell me what's going on. And so the Thunderhead told him in excruciating detail about the stadium glenning. Tens of thousands fell in a single evening. It will be all over the news in a few moments, even if the North American side don't tries to hide it. It's too big to erase, and it will lead to a chain reaction of events that will leave the world in an unprecedented upheaval. What are we going to do about it? Grayson asked. Nothing, the Thunderhead said. It is a scythe action, which means I cannot even react to it. I must treat it as if it never happened. Well, said Grison, you can do anything, but I can. Continue what you've been doing, the Thunderhead instructed him. Now more than ever, the civilians will need to be reined in. And then the Thunderhead said something that chilled him. The odds that civil and Tonys will seriously damage the future of humanity have ticked up to 19.3%.